Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Today I am going to answer two questions that were posed to me by Michael Garfield in the comments to my video Eliminating Death Part 1, Death as Waste. Mr. Garfield writes, Janati, how would you respond to these observations from an evolutionary biologist and fellow fan of futurist speculation? His first observation is, quote, Evolution as we understand it requires death. Creation and destruction are only two aspects of the same thing. Death and change are inseparable. Well, my response to this first observation is that I completely disagree with every statement other than the first. And with regard to the first statement, evolution as it has occurred through natural selection does involve death in the sense that an individual organism doesn't evolve. Evolution occurs on a species level across many, many generations. However, that does not imply in any way that evolution is somehow normatively desirable, something that should be advanced by us as individuals and seen as moral from the standpoint of us as individuals. In fact, Evolution is one of the cruelest, most appallingly wasteful processes. An important fact is 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed are now extinct. Furthermore, evolution offers no protections to the individual, no guarantees that an individual who is more meritorious, either in terms of any sorts of innate abilities or in terms of what that individual has actually accomplished in the world, is actually going to survive. That individual could trip on a rock, fall, and die, even if, under all other objective standards, that individual would have been fitter in an evolutionary sense. But morality, fundamentally, exists at a much higher level than evolution. It exists at the level of a rational, thinking, volitionally conscious individual being. Morality doesn't begin with rocks, it doesn't begin with plants, it doesn't begin with worms. It begins with creatures who can think in a moral sense, who can ask the question, what should I do? And realize that the answer to that question presupposes the continuation of that creature's life because without the continuation of one's life, one cannot keep answering that question, what should I do? I have a two-part video series on this called Life as the Origin and Basis of Morality, which I recommend that everyone, including Mr. Garfield, watch. But morality starts with the individual. Evolution is a phenomenon that occurs within species and across species as new species are formed through natural selection over many, many generations. There's nothing inherently progressive about evolution, though. Indeed, there have been many periods throughout uh, the history of the Earth where more advanced species, think of the dinosaurs, have been wiped out by some cataclysm, and for a long time thereafter, less advanced species were the ones that were most prevalent, and eventually we emerged, but there was nothing written in any sort of cosmic law saying that all evolution had to culminate with us, and that we, at present, just because we came about through the process of evolution, have to perpetuate that very same process in that very same way. Once human beings arrived on the scene, with their ability to reason, with their ability to think from a moral point of view, with their ability to respect every individual and not just see an individual as some sort of disposable tool for uh, some vaguely defined greater good, we had the power, and we should use that power, to change the prevailing rules by which life operates. We have already done that with many species. Some of them have benefited quite considerably from that. 
think of domestic dogs and cats and the tremendously better and longer lives that they lead because humans take care of them. But it has been the same with us. We, by utilizing technology, by utilizing reason, by utilizing science, and that includes not only the natural sciences, but also the sciences of man, what Ludwig von Mises, the great economist, would have called the sciences of human action. We have been able to create a better world, where we live about five times longer on average now than our Paleolithic ancestors have, and where we have the potential to live even longer, not only through biomedical interventions, but also through technologies that reduce the risk of physical accidents, that reduce social strife, including warfare and political oppression, and that enable us to treat one another more civilly and engage in more productive interactions than our ancestors have done. All of these are departures from biological evolution. Indeed, we are taking on the role of guiding evolution, as we have been for millennia, ever since the first agricultural revolution, circa 10,000 BCE, human beings have been guiding the evolution of crops and domestic animals. Now, we have more refined tools. We can artificially create bacteria, for instance, that can perform a variety of useful functions, such as cleaning up toxic spills. We can genetically engineer foods to be more nutritious and have fewer toxic byproducts. And hopefully, in the near future, we will be able to genetically re-engineer our own bodies, as well as repair the damage that accumulates in our own bodies throughout life, in order to correct for the necessary flaws in the evolutionary outcome that has led to humans. Because, honestly, evolution is quite apathetic past a certain point. It is evolutionarily advantageous to have the traits that enable one to survive to reproductive age and to reproduce and maybe even to help rear one's grandchildren, which is why humans with their current genetic code can be as long-lived as they are. However, past a certain point, evolution doesn't care. Evolution is not a teleological force. It doesn't have any sort of benevolent motives whatsoever. And if evolution doesn't care about us, about the survival of each of us as individuals, why should we care about it, except insofar as it could be a useful instrument for us if we harness it and utilize it in a guided fashion to serve our objectives as thinking, volitionally conscious moral beings. So that was his first statement. I will also add my response that I do not believe that creation and destruction are two sides of the same coin, so to speak. They're diametrically opposite. Creation is the bringing of greater order out of disorder or chaos. Conservation of matter would lead us to think that we cannot bring the raw stuff of existence into being, but we can rearrange it. So a creative individual makes a more complex arrangement out of disorder whereas destruction is the breaking down of that complex arrangement. Now, his second statement is, quote, people who do live to 80 plus years seem to develop an understanding of the world that allows them to welcome death as the fulfillment of one stage and the possible beginning of another, irrespective of their personal beliefs. I do not concur with that either. First of all, because I know that a super centenarian in Japan who died in 2009, his name was Tomoji Tanabe, had stated when asked how long he wants to live that he would like to live indefinitely. And unfortunately, he only got to live to age 113. However, he made that statement at age 112, meaning that he was happy to keep on living even though he was quite senesced at that time. He still 
saw that life had a whole lot to offer and he didn't want to give it up. Another great example of an individual older than 80 who wanted to live indefinitely was Robert Ettinger, who is famous as being the pioneer of cryonics and the founder of the Cryonics Institute. This was a cause that he had championed throughout his life and true to his principles, when he died in 2011, he asked to be cryopreserved, and he was. So hopefully, if his premises are correct, and if the procedure that preserved him would also have preserved his inus, or as some would call it, his subjective continuity after he is reanimated at some hypothetical future time, hopefully he will have the fulfillment of his wish and will live on in the future. But those are two great examples of people past the age of 80 who wanted to live a lot longer without limit. Even Benjamin Franklin back in the 18th century was a proto-transhumanist and life extensionist. He wrote about the desirability of conquering disease and senescence, and he had a very poignant passage where he regretted that he might have been born too soon to benefit from these technological advances. So let's hope that we are not born too soon, and let's hope that our ambitions extend to indefinite longevity, even if and when we reach that threshold of 80 years. I don't think all people uh, fall into the category of thinking that Mr. Garfield describes, and if some do, I can find a plausible explanation for that. It is that these individuals may have experienced severe health problems. They're not as energetic as they used to be. They don't have the same abilities to accomplish that they used to be, and perhaps there is a measure of regret within them for that. Perhaps they think it might be better to get it over with. And that's very sad. It's very tragic. If they see death as some sort of next stage, then there's absolutely no scientific basis for it. There's absolutely no reason to believe that from an individual's vantage point, anything continues after death. The theists will often posit that there is some sort of afterlife, some sort of existence of an immaterial soul, again, assuming that existence on faith without any sort of empirical or rational evidence to back it up. However, for someone who doesn't have that theistic belief, to posit that death is some sort of next stage is, I'm afraid, wishful thinking. It may be wishful thinking that some people will readily engage in as a way to rationalize what they would perceive to be an otherwise futile situation, especially if they don't believe that any sort of way out of that situation is feasible, any sort of sustainable life extension which would require the reversal of senescence and frailty. So those are my responses to uh, Mr. Michael Garfield. I do not think that there is any normative value in evolution. I do not think that creation requires destruction. And I do not think that people older than the age of 80 will necessarily show a resigned acceptance of death or an eager acceptance of death or a philosophical, calm acceptance of death. None of that is necessary. I think every human life as an individual life has inherent value. As long as a person is an innocent person who has not gravely harmed other human beings, that person is worthy of continued life. And hopefully the advent of improved medical technologies will enable more and more people of every age group to fulfill that ambition. Thank you very much.